Okay. The first week in our grudge match, we talked about offense. The second week in grudge match, which was last week, we talked about forgiving others. This week, we're going to talk about forgiving ourselves. We're going to talk about forgiving ourselves. Um, so, this is something that I think is going to weigh heavy on our hearts. And so, like, like I did last, or like Kelly did last week for her, her message, I, um, I put all the references right up there so you guys can write them down or look at them at another point, because we're going to be moving through things um, this week. We're going to talk about Peter. But here's the truth, church. Here's the truth. Some of us, some of us are deeply ashamed and unable to release ourselves of our failures. Some of us are deeply ashamed and unable to release ourselves of our failures. Now, I know like sometimes when I, when I preach a message, I start off with something kind of funny. You know, I've been trying to do that more lately. But this one I'm having a little bit of a hard time with because I know that this is such a hard truth. This is such a hard reality. I know that there are moments in our lives where, where we have experienced things that have required us to forgive others. And we have forgiven others. We've had moments in our life where, where someone has done something really bad to us. They, they've, as, as the scripture says, they've trespassed against us and it has caused us great pain. It has humiliated us. It has caused us to suffer in such big ways. And we've dealt with that. We've grappled it. We've, we've tackled it. And we begin to address it in our lives. And, and, and we begin to let people go of the things and the burdens and the, and, and the things that they've done to us. But how many of us have done something deeply shameful in our own lives and we continue to, if you will, assault ourselves with it? We continue to create pain in our lives with it. We continue to, um, we, we continue to hurt self. I've found... At least in my own life, the hardest person to forgive is often me. That's the hardest person to forgive. It is often me. I mean, like, like sometimes we float around life and, and, and we consider these things. It's when we wake up in the first thing in the morning or when we're going to bed. It's when the quiet happens. Maybe the kids and, and wife or, or husband have to leave the home for a minute. You know, whatever moment you have where there is what we like to call peace and quiet, it's not peace and quiet. It's quiet, but it's not peaceful. It's, it's, it's painful at times. You know that. You know what you did. Right? You think of those things. You know what you did. You know what you were thinking about. You know what you said. You know what you didn't do. That's the hard one. Like Sometimes like you did something, and you did something. It was awful. It was bad. It was horrible. You did something. But then there are the other times where you're just like, I should have stepped up. I should have said something. I should have spoken. I should have, I should have responded, and you didn't. The wounds you gave others were deep. The ways that we wound ourselves are deep. You've done it this time, like like, right? You've done it this time. You went too far. Some of us, like we 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 recap our history, and we're just like, man, I got a way of blowing up my life. I have a way of creating disaster in my life. I have a way of creating pain in my life. I have a way of doing things that I know that I shouldn't have done. And we experience this. Like, it gets down to the point where, as silly as this sounds, we walk around saying, dummy. But you can add the expletive, right? Because some of us have been there before. Like, it's not dummy, it's something else. Something very not nice. And if it's not a four-letter or five, whatever letter word you want to talk about that we shouldn't say out loud, whatever that is, it might be another word just as potent and powerful as what we consider a cuss word. It's just like, man. I did it this time. I did it this time. And I really created damage. Now, the terrible thing about forgiving self as well as the trouble with it is that we have in many ways moved past it. The people around us have forgiven us of it. They, they've, they've let it go. They've responded to our trespass and they said, I'm not going to hold you responsible for that anymore. And they released you, but you continue to hold yourself responsible. You continue to hold yourself responsible. Why? Because some of us are deeply ashamed. Some of us are deeply ashamed and we can't seem to let ourselves release ourselves of our failures. We can't seem to release ourselves of our failures. Now I know that 1 John 1.9 says this. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and purifies from all unrighteousness. Now I know that God is good. And I believe Jesus when he tells us these things. I believe his promises. I believe that Jesus can forgive me. That's great. You know, Lord, you forgave me. You, you released me of this. But, Lord, I just I cannot find myself to be free of this. And sure, Lord, you know, you're wonderful and you're amazing and you're, you're, you're spectacular and you just, like, you freed me up. But, oh, I'm just, just going to continue to carry this burden with me. It's like the baggage. It's the luggage. It's the ball and chain. Whatever you want to call it, it's this thing that you keep lugging around. You ever notice that, that like sometimes, you know, that, that this, this thing happens where you begin to feel such oppression that it changes the way you hold your body. Like you, you begin to like kind of hunch. We got hunch. I mean, I know some of us, you know, we have bad posture. That's different, you know, like I have bad posture. I've been working on it. But, but like sometimes like it is a physical symptom that is a result of an inner turmoil of that unforgiveness. I was talking to my wife just a few weeks ago, um, actually more like a, a month or so ago, and I was considering some of the things that had happened in the past, some of the things that I couldn't forgive myself from. Now, you know, my story is not your story. My experiences are not your experiences, but I know in my own life when I look back, I have regret at times, and I have to work through that. Even though my wife has forgiven me, even if those things weren't committed in the lifetime that we've had together, I've had to ask for her forgiveness. And I remember telling my wife one day, it's like, she's like, you look taller. I'm like, oh, yeah, look at me. You know, like, I mean, you know, I've been at the doctor and I'm 5'4", I'm give or take, you know. And uh, talk about forgiving others. I, working at Easter Seals, this one kid came up to me one day and he's like, he's like hey, hey, um, you, know, you know what happens when you get older, right? And he's like, what? And he's like, you just keep, you keep shrinking. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah. He said, by the time you're 70, you're going to be a troll. <laughs> Okay, thanks for that. Thanks for that. I mean, he was only he was only nine. I mean, it was it was oppressive and offensive, but he was only nine. Anyway, so and so like, but but she was saying you, you look taller. You look taller, and I said no. Actually, something changed in my life recently where there was this thing that was kind of holding me down, and it it was causing me. I didn't realize it, but it was causing me to kind of hunch. Like, it was causing me to feel um, visibly ashamed. Like, and, and like, if I, were to dis if I were to tell you guys, you would say to me, like, really, really, Seth, really, Pastor, that's, that's not really a big deal. Because we know that sometimes we feel shame, shame for huge things, like huge, horrible, awful things. And then sometimes we feel shame for things that really aren't our fault. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But, but it was one of those things that it wasn't something within my care. It wasn't something that I was responsible for. It wasn't something that I could have helped. It was like this, this, this shame that I felt, you know, was my shame, even though it wasn't my shame, even though it wasn't necessarily my responsibility to deal with um, as if it were my own. And I got to this point, and I'm like, you know, I'm just going to let it go. I'm going to release it. And so I released it. Then I began to notice, like, man, you stand a little taller, Seth. You stand a little taller. Like, what a benefit of being, being free of guilt, right? Like, you stand a little taller, you, 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 you feel better, you feel less oppressed, you feel less burdened, you feel less, less weighed down. So, now, we find ourselves haunted by this unrelenting anguish, if you will. This collar's bothering me. My wife said it was cute, so I'll work with it. It was only like nine dollars. I mean, and I think it looks pretty good on me. All right. Um, okay. I feel weird because my beard is like an inch and some shorter. Anyway. Um, oh come on. Anyway. All right. So so here, check this out. Okay. Um, there are different forms of guilt. All right. There are different forms of guilt. There's the guilt that leads to death. All right. The false guilt. OK, now this reference of scripture that I want to read to you guys this morning, 2 Corinthians 7, 10, I'm going to read it backwards, but it's not going to lose this context. OK, because the guilt that I want to talk about after the wrong kind of guilt, the false kind of guilt is the guilt that brings life and freedom. But but according to 2 Corinthians 7, 10, it says in the Passion Translation, it says, but the sorrow of the world leads, works death. Or in the NIV, it says, but worldly sorrow or worldly guilt brings death. Worldly guilt brings death. 
Many of us feel this, this lack of the ability to self-accept, right? We've, we lack this ability to feel ourselves released, and we are constantly condemning ourselves. It's in our unconscious. Like, it's just something that flows around in, the, in our minds without even realizing it. We just feel this burden. We feel this, we feel this pain. We feel this, this sense of frustration in our life because of something that, that we did. <coughs> <coughs> And something that we can't change. Thank you. Something we can't change. Now, this, this false guilt comes in two different forms, right? It's the, it's the false guilt of holding on to something that you did do wrong. All right? Now, we'll talk about the right kind of guilt in a minute. But it's something that you hold on to, something that you've been released of, something that God has forgiven you of. Even your spouse or your loved one or whoever it is, your best friend, they've forgiven you of it and you're holding on to it. And then there's this other false guilt. This guilt where we take responsibility that we shouldn't take responsibility for. Like we take responsibility. Some of us, man, we are great parents. We have been great parents. Yeah, we've, we've been flawed. We've made some bad decisions from time to time. But from the day that our child was conceived up until the point that, you know, before they were conceived, we were praying for them. Up until the point that they launched out of the home, we did everything in our power to love them and to help them and to support them. And then things just messed up. And like, what did I do? What did I do? What did I do so wrong? What did I do that, that did not set them on the right path? What did I do to not prepare them for what they were going to face? And we hold responsibility on ourselves for something that happened with our children when it really isn't our fault. You gave them all the tools. You gave them all the things that they needed. And they launched out of your home and they did their own thing anyway. They made poor decisions. They made poor choices. They, 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 they made wrong relational choices. And, and you're watching them blow their life up. And you feel like it's your fault. You do. You do. And some of us, we need to repent because we did some things wrong. And maybe for some reasons it is. But, but for a lot of people, like for some people it's like, ah, oh, I, I didn't do enough or I didn't do what I was supposed to. But you did everything that you could. You did everything that you were supposed to. You worked so hard on that child. And you're like, why? Why? And you rob your joy by a constant sense of guilt because their flaws you feel are your fault. And that's not always the case. You see, there's this, this false guilt that this false guilt that, yes, yes, it's a false guilt that you hold on to something that you shouldn't have uh, you shouldn't hold on to because you've been released by the creator of it. And you need to forgive yourself just as, as significantly as he's forgiven you. But you oftentimes I oftentimes carry around things that are not within my power to change. And that stinks. Why? That's horrible. Why? Because the scripture tells us right away that worldly guilt, worldly sorrow, it brings death. And you've watched it. It may not be a physical death necessarily, but you watch part of your life wither and fade away. You've watched part of your life, your joy fade. <clears throat> You've watched part of your happiness fade. You've watched part of your personal experience with, with that loved one fade. You've watched as you've lost things within your own soul because you held yourself responsible for something that you were released of and you allowed worldly guilt that brings death. But the Bible tells us in the same verse going to the beginning of the verse, this is in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, it says, God designed us to feel remorse or to feel guilt over sin in order to produce repentance that leads to victory or leads to deliverance. You see, guilt directed by godly love leads to life. Guilt, guilt, listen to this, guys. Guilt directed by godly love leads to life. It leads to life. Guilt directed by godly love. You ever felt guilty about something and you turned to the creator and in his love he brought you closer to himself and said, okay, yes, you messed up. You failed big time this, uh, this time, Seth. You failed big time, but you were trusting me with the guilt that you are now experiencing. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the guilt that you now have in your own heart, and I'm going to leverage it for victory. I'm going to show you how the thing that you know you are responsible for is something you need to take care of, something that you need to free yourself from, something that you need, that it was necessary for you to know I messed up. I, I messed up. And I feel guilt for it. 
I feel sorrow for it, but I'm going to trust you, Lord. I'm going to trust you with my remorse because I know that it's going to bring repentance. It's going to produce repentance and victory and deliverance. You see, the guilt led by conviction is the beginning stages of life's greatest changes. Listen, this is so critical. It robs hell of another soul and gives us with the promise of heaven. What am I saying? When a sinner realizes that they're guilty of sin, when a sinner realizes that there's only one way for them to experience heaven, when a sinner realizes that there is no way in their own power capacity that they could, by carrying their own guilt, be enough to earn paradise, when they come to that recognition and say, yeah, I am messed up, but I need Jesus, and that guilt caused them to respond, it creates the moment, the place of the greatest changes in our life. God leveraging our guilt, us trusting God with our guilt, it changes the trajectory of everything. Yeah, you feel remorse for a reason. You feel guilt for a reason, yes. But don't just allow it to weigh you down. Don't allow yourself to carry the responsibility. Why? Because Jesus carried it for us, as hard as that is to accept. And so Peter, the loyalty of Peter was weak when he was tested. And the pain of failure was expressed in his own bitter tears. In Matthew 26, 33 through 35, we hear about it. Peter, even if all fall away, right? They're having their meal and he's talking about how, you know, he's going to die. He's going to die. He's going to be turned over and he's going to be crucified. And, and, and Peter's like, Peter, you know, he talks a lot. He's like, oh, hold on, hold on, Jesus. Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night... Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. And all of them scattered. Now Peter, though, Peter's like, you know, like, like they all said the same, but Peter started it. He's like, no, 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 no. Jesus, no, no, no. I will die with you. I'm not going to let you die. I will die with you. And we know how the story goes. But that night in the garden, you know, Jesus is being arrested. This is found in John 18 and 10 through 12, just real quick here. Jesus being arrested and Peter being Peter, he's like, all right, fine. You know, you're not taking my Lord. He pulls out his sword and cut, chops off this guy named Malchus, just cuts his ear off. Just, I, I imagine he was aiming for his head. I don't know. Probably was. I mean, that's kind of close in the proximity area. It would have been a really cool miracle if Jesus were to, like, put. Anyway, um, <laughs> That's really weird, but, but Jesus is like, hold on, wait a minute, Peter, and he puts the ear back on Malchus's, you know, the, the, the piece of ear back on Malchus's, Malchus's uh, face or ear, and, and he heals it, and that was like this significant moment, though. It was powerful. It was amazing, but, but, but um, Peter's like, no, 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 I'm going to back up my promise by fighting with sword for you not to be arrested. For you not to be arrested, for you to not be taken prisoner, taken into custody because I know it's coming. And so, like, like it, this happens, Jesus heals Malchus, and, and, and Jesus is arrested. And just like that, just like that, Peter disowns and denies him. We know how the story goes in Luke 22, 59 through 62. It says, but an hour later, an hour later, another asserted, certainly, certainly, this is how the story goes, certainly, um, this fellow was with him. For he is a Galilean. This happened three times, guys. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. This was the third example. The rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Peter remembered the word of the Lord, had, the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. 62, and he went outside and wept bitterly. All right, it's one thing to betray the one you'd follow, the one that you call rabbi, the one you call teacher, the one you begin to call savior. It's one thing to deny him, to disown him. But can you imagine watching Jesus being taken away to be punished and crucified? And he looks at you in the face after you've denied him for the third time. Do you want to talk about anguish and pain and suffering? You want to talk about trying to forgive yourself? I mean, Peter messed up big time. I mean, this is a guy who was going through his life and, and, and Jesus <clears throat> captivated him. He began to follow him. And, and the night that Jesus is like, all right, I've been talking about this for a while. It's finally going to happen. And Peter's like, no, it's not. I will die with you. I will die with you. And then raises his sword to prove that. And then later disowns Jesus just as Jesus said he would. 
I would have wept bitterly. I would have experienced anguish. I can't even begin to imagine what I would feel in my own life. Now, I'll tell you this honestly. I'm no better than Peter. I don't think anybody in this room could say that. The, the only difference is, is we weren't physically next to Christ when we said these things. We weren't looking at him straight directly in the eye. But everybody in this room could honestly and sincerely say to themselves, yeah, I've denied him a few times. I've denied him. I've denied his presence in my life. I've denied that I belong to him. You see, shame is the devil's playground. Shame is the devil's playground. This guilt becomes shame. The devil uses, the devil uses shame to connect our actions to our identity. You see, the devil wants to drive this wedge between us and God through shame. The God of mercy guides us toward his grace through salvation free of regret. We know that, but, but the devil is working with everything inside of him to create this wedge to, to remove us from the creator, to remove us from the love of Jesus, to remove us from the sacrifice that God allowed his son to take. He is doing everything in his power because the shame, shame is his playground. He wants, to con- he wants us to connect that with our identity. He wants you to feel. He wants you to think. Like, I, I, I want to believe, but I feel pathetic. I feel worthless. I feel hopeless. I'm a failure. God will never bless me because of what I did. I'll never be happy. I'll never have a good marriage. I'll never make a difference. My pain, my personal pain, the pain that I'm experiencing right now is a punishment for my past. This is just my burden to carry. Yes. Yes. Exactly the right. Lies. Lies. Well, you know, th- this is what I did, and this is just, you know, this is mine to carry from this point forward. This is my responsibility. I just got to do, you know, th- this is mine. Yes, it can be yours, and you can own it, but that does not mean that you are not forgiven of it, and that does not mean that you can't forgive yourself of it. I know how hard that is. But we walk around, and we just like, you know, one after another speak contempt over our life. Just one time after another, speak contempt over our life and just feel and believe with such strong insecurity. Man, man. But here's what happened. And you know, Peter attempted to go back to life as usual, but Jesus refused to let him go. Peter didn't go and find Christ. Do you realize that? Christ went and found him. Like if you read the story, if you follow the storyline in John 21, 15 through 19, you know, like like this area of scripture right here says Jesus reinstates Peter. He reinstates him or or he brings him back into the family, brings him back into the fold. Why? Because Peter's like, man, I so messed up. I messed up everything. He's probably hearing that Jesus is back around. He's like, you know, I'm just going to go back to life. I'm going to go back on the boats. I'm going to go fishing. I'm just going to do what I was doing before this whole thing, and I'm going to do my best to forget it. Doubtful. You know, he's probably tossing those nets into the water, remembering the words that Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men, right? Thinking of all, dwelling on all the miracles that Jesus had done, dwelling on the miracles that had happened before with the amazing, sudden, awesome uh, catching of fish. Like all these different things Peter is probably thinking about. And he's there in the boat. And we know that, that like things happen. And, and you know, <clears throat> I could tell the whole story, but I just I want to hone in on this one moment. But they, they're back at shore, and they're sitting down. They're getting ready to eat some fish. When they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, he said this. He says, hey, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my, she- feed my lambs or feed my sheep. And in verse 16, again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? I've answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time, the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time. Do you love me? Do you love me? I said, Lord, you know all things and you know that i love you and jesus said feed my sheep and then verse 18 says very truly i tell you when you were younger and dressed yourself and went where you wanted but when you are old you will stretch out your hands and and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go 
verse 19, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter would die. He would be martyred for his faith. He would die for the truth of Jesus. He would pay the ultimate price, the most gloried price, the most gifted opportunity anybody could ever experience by dying for his Savior. But Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? The, 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 rich, the, the, the rhythm of that forgiveness, the rhythm of that peace. Like, I imagine that it was hard. I mean, even the scripture says that it hurt Peter to say that again and again. But can you can, just, just realize, he denied him three times. Jesus asked him to, to, you know, asked him if he loved him three times. Like, I know some of us are like, man, Jesus, you're just really like poking it to him and jabbing him. Like, you, you got to tell me three times because you denied me three times. Do you realize that maybe for this is what Peter needed? And maybe this is something Peter needed. Peter needed to be reminded that each time that he transgressed his Savior, each time that he denied, each time that he forgot, that he, he neglected, that he told people that he didn't know him, each time he needed to be reminded of his great love for the Savior. And just like that, he's released. You see, guilt that leads to true and bold confession is where the soul, where our soul, where the soul is of ours is liberated. It is liberated. Our soul is liberated when guilt leads to confession. True guilt, bold guilt, honest guilt. I know that I'm talking about the guilt of unforgiveness of self, and we know that there is tragic implications of feeling that guilt that destroy our lives. But the truth is, is that when we experience that guilt, if we say, okay, I am not in the right place. I made bad choices. I know that I have. I am not a mistaker. I'm a sinner. Jesus, I need you. And he comes right to us. And he's like, yep, you're guilty, but I'm going to set you free. You're guilty, but you know what? The guilt sentence that you should take, I took it. I took the guilty, and I took it upon myself so that you could be free. And he looks at your guilt. He looks at you taking responsibility, and he does something significant. We call it repentance. Repentance is recognizing how sinful we are and turning from the disaster that's coming. It's at that place that we're liberated. You see, guilt, guilt in our lives is unavoidable. It's something that's going to happen to us all. You're going to say something to your spouse and you're going to feel guilt over it. What are you going to do with that guilt? Is it going to make you feel shame and feel like, man, you damaged the relationship. It's never going to get better. Or are you going to realize that that guilt is an opportunity for you to meet God in a new way? Are you going to allow that guilt to hold you down? Are you going to hold yourself responsible so much that it weighs you down, that you carry it your whole life, that it burdens you so much that it changes the features on your face by the time you are old? Or are you going to say, okay, Jesus, I'm guilty as charged, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to confess, and I'm going to find my soul liberated. Let it go, right? That's what we need to do is we need to let it go. The lies, the fears, the insecurities, the neglect, the, the bad choices, the cheating, the words, the, the hate, all of it, the addictions, all of it, we got to let it go. All the things that have brought us to this place where we feel it is our responsibility to punish ourselves for the things that we did. All of those things, we got to let it go. You can't change the past, but God can change your future. You can't change your past. Forgiveness won't change the past, but forgiveness will bring freedom to your future. Catch that. Man, you can't change the past. Forgiveness will not change the past. It won't change what happened. It won't change what took place. It won't change the decisions you made. It won't change the damage that you may have caused. But I tell you right now, the moment you find forgiveness, the moment that you intersect with the Savior and everything changes, that moment, it brings freedom to your future. It changes everything about what is ahead. The beautiful thing is, is the greatest failures of our lives can become the greatest platforms of our lives. You ever been bold and honest with somebody like like somebody who's just walking through life they're trudging through and they're just like man i made a terrible choice and it has cost me so much some people in prison are using their personal convictions of being put in there as a platform to help others with the gospel they're like man 
I messed up. I messed up so bad that it landed me in court and it landed me in a jail cell. I'm forgiven. I've forgiven myself. And so can you. I've watched it. I've seen it. I've recognized it. That these moments in our lives, yes, the devil brings us to our past. He tries to bring up our past. He tries to bring up our past. But every time he does that, we've got to look at the glory and the purpose and the intent of the future that Christ has set before us. You know, some people say, well, the next, you know, the, the next time the, the devil reminds you of, of your, your past, remind him of his future. Yeah, that's true. He's defeated. He's going to be defeated. Yeah, he's a real guy, just so you know. He's real. He's out there. All right? I've come toe-to-toe with some of his cronies or followers or whatever. All right? I know cronies is kind of like a dumb word. But, but like, I, I've come, con- you know, face-to-face contact with them. And I understand that. Like, next time the devil reminds you of his past, remind him of his, you know, remind you of your past, remind him of his future. No, no, no. Like, don't focus so much on him. No, no, no. I, I know your future. I'm going to focus on my future now. Yeah, you can remind me of what happened, but I'm going to ri- remind you of the, 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 the Savior that I serve and what Jesus did for me. And your constant trying to keep me, um, you know, focused on and fixated on trying to keep me in my subconscious, thinking about those things in the past. I'm going to look to my future. I'm going to realize just what lies ahead. What lies ahead? Why? Because in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. He's a new creation. He's a new creation. The old is gone. She's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. The old is gone, it's new has come. It's not a renovation project, it's a resurrection experience. Come on, you guys, listen to me here. All right, it's not enough for him to just get in and get the walls and make you a little bit better. No, 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 you were dead and now you're alive. This isn't about making bad people good. This is making dead people alive, right? We've already said that many, 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 many times before. But I tell you, my own personal life, I, you know, I grew up in church and, you know, I experienced certain things. And then I w- was taken from church. And then I went back to church and so on and so forth. You know, like, like, you know, I knew from the earliest stages of my life that I had been called to ministry. But, man, I defaulted. I tried to run. I did a whole, you know, you know, I, I did a whole Jonah, like just trying to escape the plan of God. And I got to that place in my life when I was graduating high school and I was just like, man, I, you know, like, like the, the, the decisions, the, the turmoil, the pain, the suffering, all those things that I did, man. And, and still at times today, I got to ask God to help me to forgive myself of those things. But, but I got to that place and it's like, it's not enough for Jesus to just say, okay, we're going to renovate. No, no, no. I need to become new because I was too busted, too broken, too empty, too dilapidated to be just fixed up. I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, I'm God, and, and I love you, and, and I love you through my son Jesus, so this is what we're going to do, all right? We're going to just toss that old crap and that old junk and that old busted mess. We're going to make it go away. And look at this. You're a new man. You're a new woman. You're, you're a new person. The old is gone, as new is calm. See, when we meet God, the place of our greatest guilt, he resurrects us. He resurrects us. I love the fact that he pursued Peter. He just like, okay, you messed up. Come find me, Peter, so we can work things out. I don't know. You realize that, that he is in pursuit of you all the time. That Christ is in pursuit of people. He is always chasing, always after us. I love that. And our greatest failures and our greatest mess, like, I reject you. I'm walking away. I'm going to spit in your face, whatever. I'm just going to get away from you. And Jesus is, like, right there in tow, like, just waiting for us to turn around, waiting for that moment where you just, like, turn around like, oh, I messed up. Look how far he is. And he's right there. He's right there. And he's like, come here. Hey. Hey, come here. Come here. Bring it in. I love you. I love you. Think about these questions as we close today. What is the source of your guilt and how has it affected you? Because I tell you right now, there's two effects that it can cause. What is the source of your guilt? How has it affected you? Has it brought you down or has it lifted you towards God? What are some ways you could start viewing guilt as an opportunity to grow closer to God? And third, what steps could you take this week to let go and accept God's forgiveness? Right now, what are you going to do about it? Right now, what are you going to do about it? Like, you might not be thinking about it right now. 
It might be out of your mind, but when you leave here, you hit your, your head hits the pillow tonight or tomorrow, the week, work week starts, and you think, you consider, you're going to be reminded of, you're going to hear a song on the radio, you're going to drive by a location on the road, maybe something happened, I don't know. You're going to bump into somebody. You're going to see them in public. Whatever it is, something is going to cause you to suddenly be reminded, and then you're going to have to say, okay, Jesus has forgiven me. I can forgive myself. I just want you to know the freedom that can be experienced. We are all in a grudge match. We are all in a grudge match. And one of our greatest grudge matches is the grudge match that takes place within. Now, one of the hardest things for me, just real quick, is when when things started to get messed up with my family and I watched my dad beat my be my mom when, I, when those moments happened, when I watched those experiences take place, when I watched him wither away from drug addiction. As a young child, I was not even 10 years old yet, and, and, and like it, it was revealed to me later on that hate began to infect my heart. Like you don't even realize it when you're that young sometimes. You just, you hate. You hate, you hate, you hate. You hate. And I tell you, like, like he died. He died, and I hated him for a long, longer after that. And some of you guys know this story because you've been here for a little while. But, you know, like we moved up here. His, his um, grave is down in Newington, which is kind of close to Portsmouth, uh, Dover area. Um, his, his grave is down there by our family, uh, Frank family farm. And, and I thought to myself, I'm going to go down there. I'm going to stand at his grave, and I'm just going to have this epiphany kind of moment. I'm going to feel free all of a sudden. Didn't happen. Standing there staring at a gravestone wondering when my moment was going to take place, wondering when I was going to find freedom once and for all. You see, I held myself responsible. I felt guilt over my hate for him. And I could never say to him, Dad, I'm sorry that I hate you. Dad, I'm sorry that I hate you. I could never say that to him. And so I felt responsible. I felt guilt. You know what else I felt guilt about? I felt guilt that my life wasn't enough for him to change. Like it was my fault. Why wasn't I good enough? Why wasn't I enough for him to say, you know what, Seth and his sister Leah are worth it to not fall into these traps? I felt guilt for a long time. A long time. And I'll tell you right now, as your minister, I am flawed and it's still at times a work in progress. Because I have to recollect, yeah, I forgave him. I forgave him. And, you know, like, like some of us are like, I want it to just be that moment where it's just like suddenly like, oh, it's gone. No, no, no. Standing at that graveside, it didn't happen. It was a process for me, at least for me. It took time. Okay. We're going to work through this. We're going to get through this, Seth. We're going to deal with this. We're going to address this. I'm going to be free. I'm going to be free. I'm going to be free until I was finally free. Where are you guys at? What's going on? What are you feeling? Because I tell you right now, the liberation that happened in my soul when I finally found the Savior at that place and said, okay, remove this guilt that I'm carrying. Oh man, the liberation is something that I cannot define. and something that I want you to experience today. Father, I thank you so much for truth. I thank you so much for your love and your sacrifice. I pray, God, right now that as we battle the grudge match of life, as we fight back and forth with our experiences, as we consider the things that we did, as we experience false guilt, I pray, God, right now, like Peter, we would recognize just how much we love you. And we would notice that even if we've walked and journeyed and ran far from you because of the bitter tears that we've experienced within, as soon as we turn around, you are right there staring at us with open arms because you pursue us. I pray right now, Jesus, that we would experience freedom. In this moment, Lord, as we consider these questions, these thoughts, God, I pray above anything else I've said, Lord, that your word would penetrate hearts this morning and freedom would come to this people. Whether in this building or watching online, Lord, I pray right now that freedom would be experienced fully, completely, and totally. And I thank you for freeing me. And I ask God that these would feel the same liberation. 